that covers the first part. And I think the most important part and most probably difficult for anyone not dealing directly in antennas is the choice of antenna. Now, I would say the, the things that you have to look at is first the technology. Um, of course, the most important, what frequencies um, that specific technology covers. You have to take into account what could happen in the future, and I'll show you good examples of those. And then you have to see, is the technology, does it use things like um, multiple input, multiple output? Um, then you have to look at the application in size, shape. In other words, if you're going to mount something on a vehicle, um, it's a completely different case to mounting it outside a house. Environmental and certification. And then the requirements. Do you need to receive from all directions? What's the signal levels? Is it very low? Is it reasonable? A polarization. And how high a throughput do you need? And I'm going to show that, and it's quite an important thing. I'm not really speaking to our business, but you don't always need MIMO, even if the technology um, requires or uses MIMO. You can get quite satisfactory performance if you don't need very high data throughput. And then, of course, the most important part, connectors, coax cables, brackets, mounting, lightning, and so forth. Now, this is a nice one. Um, this is a South African, but I think most probably typically in most part of the world. Right when we started the cellular antennas, there was the 900 band down there in the United States. It uh, was the AMPS band, which is about 800. So if you look at this, this would be the gain performance of a Yagi antenna. Many people at that time used Yagi antennas to boost their signal strength outdoors. And of course, it worked quite well. A Yagi antenna is quite narrow, but it performs well in this band. And um, this antenna you see here would be for example, our LPDA-92, which has got a very, very broad band, its peak is not as high as the Yagi. But if we now, and this is what I refer to as being future-proof, there's a famous saying in uh, ice hockey that says, you mustn't go to where the puck is, you must go to where the puck will be. And this sort of illustrates it. Uh, very soon thereafter, the higher bands, 17, 1800 bands were added. Um, the moment 3G sort of happened, we got the UMTS bands, which if you look at frequency here, yeah, it's about 2.1 gigahertz, got added. And if you were using that antenna, the operators typically would move their data to the higher bands, and this guy would be lost. You, you actually will need to go and put another antenna up, otherwise you will forever sit with GPRS or H, which were um, 2G data technologies. Um, as life progressed, we're going to 4G LTE. Those bands were added. We got here the, the TV bands that got reformed. In other words, uh, they call it the uh, digital dividend bands, which is used for 4G and some higher bands that's getting used. And with 5G, this is going to get much worse. But you have to, you can't always forecast when you were there that these were going to happen but you have to take into account that these may have happened so just look at it in terms of what may happen otherwise you may be um in a in a creek with no paddle um, like this case here this is a question we often get because when we write a spec or a brochure for an antenna we would say this is a 2g 4g whatever antenna but the biggest message here is antennas don't care about technology. In other words, they radiate and they've got a gain and a bandwidth and all their properties at a certain frequency. So even though not all our antennas may be so specified for Wi-Fi, many of our LTE antennas actually would cover Wi-Fi bands. And if they do, they will work. The same with technologies such as RFID, ZigBee. Um, these guys operate at uh, sort of 680 Oh, sorry, yeah, 680 megahertz. Many of the GSM antennas that we make work at that band. Zigbee is at 2.4, license free. Uh, not even sure where Z Wave is, but um, oh, it's actually indicated over there. Um, if you look at uh, LoRa, um, so even though antenna may not be marked as a LoRa antenna, Sigfox antenna, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if it's operational and its performance is within that frequency band. It doesn't care, doesn't know whether it's called the LoRa or whatever antenna, it will radiate 
um, waves in the frequency bands that it's specified for. So I think that's an important point. Note the bands, here they are, and if an antenna operates there, it will operate in that application. It does not need to be called a LoRa antenna, for example. Applications. This is most probably one of the most important parts because I've just indicated some of them here. Households, you may have outdoor antennas um, that you wish to mount on households. Could be directional, could be omnidirectional. What you have to consider is the shape size. How do you mount them? Environmental, in other words, are they going to be in the rain? Are they going to be in uh, 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 chemical environments? Are they going to be indoors? And certifications. If you look at the commercial side, sometimes you have to use little flat antennas like that just because the devices or boxes that they're mounted on would not allow for an antenna like that to be um, used in those circumstances. Sometimes they could be an antenna like that, which will be directional, so it will only communicate in the specific directions. And this guy here would be much bigger than this one or that one. Mining is an interesting area where we've been very successful in terms of getting antennas. We designed the first Healy antennas for underground tunnels many, many years ago. Um, this is mainly for Wi-Fi underground. And um, in the last sort of five, six years, we've seen heavy use of these antennas for underground communications. Um, these are helical antennas giving you propagation. We've had reports of one kilometer and more between a base station using this type of antenna which of course sits very tightly against the sides of the tunnel and say a handheld Wi-Fi device. A year certification is a big issue. Um, you can see this darker one is actually intrinsically safe. They have to have an anti-static covering in order to be um, qualified as in, uh, intrinsically safe and very specific antennas for that environment. This type of Omni, we've also now got qualified as uh, uh, intrinsically safe antenna, but uh, in that case, it's for the, the sort of front ends where people are working and you do want omnidirectional coverage. In other words, not tunnels per se. This is often on the vehicles. And then automotive, we know that we can't fit the antennas on the left-hand side. They typically often have to be low profile, nicely shaped. In this case, um, this would be the MIMO 1, which has got both dual Wi-Fi, dual LTE and GPS antennas built into a single very low profile box. Environmental, water, sparks. Okay, we, we couldn't get a graphic because this is mainly underground in, say, coal mines. You have to look at temperature. Um, most of the antennas that we do um, actually get tested down to pretty low temperatures, often down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Of course, high temperatures the same. They have to actually be tested. Salt spray is extremely important and not always for antennas just mounted on boats. Um, just in terms of the general corrosion and resistance. Chemical, also in terms of the hazardous materials, we have to retest all of the um, components we put in, into the antennas um, using um, a, a spectral analysis to find out that they don't have any of the hazardous materials in them. Wind, they have to survive, they can't be blown down. UV is the most important. All our other antennas, of course, are UV treated, but you only discover a year or two down the line with an antenna that you've purchased have got plastic components that will disintegrate in UV or will actually survive. Um, and ruggedness. Um, ultimately, antennas on vehicles like this have to be quite rugged to survive. If you look at the type of antenna, omni versus directional is typically the, the main issue. And this is just looking at a Wi-Fi case. The reason why this is a Wi-Fi case, this is where you've got a base station um, that has to cover users. So omnidirectional, say position there, would be able to talk to all of these guys, but most probably with a lower signal level. Here you would have an antenna that covers, say, a 60 or 70 degree sector. So it will be able to talk to these guys here, but won't have much signal in these directions. They are very useful, even indoors, because if you indoors, for example, the signal traveling this way may just cause a reflection. So you could put this guy in a corner of a building and that will give a much better coverage than an Omni antenna because the Omni is actually just giving you multi-part. In other words, it's um, getting much more interference from 
reflections in directions we in any case do not want to communicate um, to. Um, I think I've said all on the right hand side, the most important one is most probably the opposite case, um, which is in a cellular situation where you are the customer. In other words, we haven't got a base station, we've got a customer. And yeah, I find it's most important to make some decisions. Um, you've got an Omni here. An Omni here has got the advantage that it will receive a number of stations, sometimes giving you redundancy, but also someone may build a new station and in which case it will be able to use it. If you use a directional antenna, it only faces this way, typically directed at a base station. If that guy's capacity is, for example, at a peak, then you have to live with it. It can't go and talk to another base station. If you want to talk to more than one operator for redundancy purposes, you can't do that. So my rule is typically, um, if you want to have redundancy amongst various cells, ease of installation, because you don't have to point the thing, um, and you don't have a very massive signal problem. In other words, you must remember that just taking the antenna from indoor to outdoor gives you about 16 dB of improvement in signal. Very often that's enough. So I think very often people don't use Omnis. If an Omni is good enough, it's always better to use it. Um, in terms of MIMO, we will discuss it a bit later, you can still use Omnis. You just have to use two of them spaced appropriate, uh, uh, far enough apart to use space diversity. If you do have a very bad signal problem, in other words, the signal even outdoors is not great, and often this is in rural or faraway situations, or you do know that you're going to talk to this operator, directional is often the best. And directional, also in terms of NEMO, gives you a much better performance because you can use cross-polarized. So there's no such case that the directional is a bad antenna. I'm just saying that um, you have to look at it and consider these sort of trade-offs in terms of which antenna you use. Often find for commercial machine-to-machine um, -machine applications, this is often better. Um, for home users, um, people that actually have got a signal problem, um, a directional antenna is a much better option. High gain is not always better, okay? And you find that the beam width as you get lower gain is bigger. So in other words, if you look at beam width, that would be a high gain antenna. This would be low gain. Of course, they align much easier, for example. These guys here, you have to start aligning quite carefully. Uh, when you get to these guys, they're going down tunnels, so not a big problem. The gain is everything. But remember that as you don't always have to go for the highest gain here. This guy may be quite useful. It's virtually omnidirectional, and it still gives you MIMO performance. If you look at omni antennas, the curve is always lower because uh, the only way an omni can force gain is by compressing the elevation, this type of pattern. You just always have to radiate in all the directions, so it's a much lower curve. And if you use high gain antennas here, this beam gets quite narrow, which could be a problem on moving vehicles. Um, you have to mount it quite vertical. You can't just sort of mount it on a, a, a loose pole or pole that's not standing absolutely upright. And that's sort of the trade-offs. They also get longer. So they get bigger this way, um, in terms of the uh, directional antennas, and in terms of omnis, you can see that's a flat guy, sort of a, uh, that's about 20 centimeters, and these guys are getting towards five, 500 millimeters or half a meter, etc. So they get longer as well. So there's a size consideration when you're going for a higher gain antenna, and you're starting to get a very focused beam either sideways or in the direction of the base station. These are the antenna types we're often confronted with. And just getting some properties of the antennas. This is a, a Yagi antenna. This would be a log periodic antenna. And this would be a panel antenna. Now, um, a, a Yagi antenna could often be used in cases where you've got, say, LoRa or something that's a narrow frequency band. Um, that's only if you know that in future, no other frequencies may be added. So future proof often low because it's quite specific to a, a, a certain band. The actual performance, the gain of this antenna is actually quite high. 
So if you know that there's only going to be one frequency used forever, quite good. Um, of course, that would be low because you can't put much in terms of technologies or different bands onto an antenna with a narrow band. And if you want to use MIMO, you require more than one antenna. The log periodic is almost the opposite of that. This antenna performs from a low frequency defined by the largest elements to a high frequency defined by these. And the one that we make goes from almost uh, 700 megahertz up to 3 gigahertz and gives you performance over that whole band. So its performance is not as high. In other words, its gain is not as high as, say, a Yagi antenna, but it will give it to you everywhere. Um, so in terms of future proof, and that we've certainly seen, it's extremely high. So people have added bands that we didn't even know of when we designed the antenna, and it could still receive them. Reliability is quite high just because of construction. Um, one product for many technologies, certainly high. You can put splitters on there and use it for different technologies to connect to. And you can use it for MIMO. Um, we've got a bracket that you can mount one of these horizontal, one vertical, and get excellent MIMO performance. But it's a big antenna. This is about one meter. If you then look at panel antennas, panel antennas, um, they're nice. They're sort of more rectangular, flat. They're unobtrusive. Um, frequency bands very much by design. But always the higher gain requires the bigger panel. And people trying to sell you a high gain antenna with a panel that's not as big as it should be is actually just um, hoodwinking you. It's a physical limitation. You can't get gain out of a very small panel. Um, feature proof is high depending on what you select because we do design these in certain bands um, specifically so that you can decide whether you may at some point need another band and we can include it. Um, reliability, medium to high, performance, quite good. And of course, it's a product that can support many technologies, but the biggest advantage is with these antennas, we often can integrate into a single enclosure, two antennas, um, 45 degree, or oh, sorry, 90 degrees polarized relative to each other, which gives you virtually your full MIMO gain. Um, if it's a two by two MIMO system, if it's four by four, you have to use two of these, and I'll show that a bit later. If you go look at Omnis, there's what I call, and we call it the thickness factor of antennas. We get antennas which are very thin. And you can visually see it there. That would be a higher gain one. That would be a low sort of magnetic mount one. And if they are thin, they are never broadband. So some of them could be dual band. So you could find an antenna like this that could give you, say, performance at some part of the 900 and some part of the 1700 band. But it will just be two dips in the performance. The same on these very tall ones. They're either very narrow band or they would break up in terms of the pattern. The pattern would not stay in the direction which you um, typically want to talk to, which is the horizontal direction. And the way to distinguish them is to look visually. Are they thin? If they are thin, they are not broadband. Okay. Um, so often people start using them at simple applications. They find that they work because work is such a a dumb term, and I honestly want to use the, the, the word dumb because you could be close to a base station, anything could work, etc. You could be at a frequency band where it happens to perform okay, etc. They're not very rugged typically. Um, and the, the performance is medium if you accept the narrow band um, because otherwise you get the pattern breakup. So they could quote your high gains, but the gain could be in a direction where it's absolutely useless for communication. If you look at the these set of antennas, that's a low gain antenna, uh, in our case, Omni 39. Uh, that's a newer version that we're doing that covers. This one's covers a really massive band. They cover um, roughly about 700 megahertz up to the high end uh, bands of 2.7 gigahertz. And the one thing that you will notice is that they are fat. Now, I'm not gonna explain to someone how to design antennas, but I can tell you that it is impossible to design an antenna that covers a wide frequency band, which is not fat as well. So thickness factor is actually a requirement. So of course, it doesn't look as neat and thin as that guy, but it will actually cover all of the bands or all of the bands that it claim and many more bands than you can ever do with a thin antenna such as that. That is just a 
higher gain version of the same thing. But once again, you have to compare that with that. And you can see it's a fatter antenna, um, about 500, 600 millimeter long. And it can actually give you a wide frequency band and good pattern performance over that whole band. But that is certainly just not possible with a thin antenna. And ultimately, Omni, you get low profile antennas. Um, they can't ever be as good as an antenna like this. They compromise one way or the other. But here you have to look at the actual performance of it. In other words, is it really omnidirectional? If the gain of these antennas are specified high, they're actually bad because they've got some kind of beam in one direction, whereas you would like a beam in most directions. So yeah, you should go for a low gain antenna uh, with a decent pattern performance and they're compromised, but they're nice and rugged. And if they're designed with a wide frequency band, of course, uh, nice future proof and they often use in machine to machine. But I think future proof is crucial because you don't want to have something where you go change antennas um, every 18 months. MIMO. MIMO is an extremely important aspect in both the um, Wi-Fi band, if you look at any of the technologies, especially 802, 11AC, but even um, 11N, and anything uh, above 3G, in other words, the LTE bands, they use MIMO, more than one antenna on both the transmit side and the receive side. And what MIMO simply does, it's separate from everything else. It simply if you've got two by two MIMO, it's got the potential to double your data rate. Okay, so you don't have to use two antennas with a MIMO modem. So just because the modem has got two ports, doesn't mean you have to put two antennas on. If your application does not require high throughput, and throughput's all you get with MIMO, then you can go with a single antenna, and it's often a very simple solution. The one thing you have to be careful of, some of the hardware don't like you to leave the one port open, but you can simply put a little stubby antenna, which normally is supplied with the modem, onto that other port, and that would be fine. You can also terminate it, but I would say stubby antenna, more than good enough um, if the hardware complains about only having one antenna. But do remember that, only one antenna necessary unless throughput is the important consideration. Here we've got an integrated MIMO antenna, so inside here is two antennas, also two cables coming out. You can of course also do MIMO by combining two single antennas, like that, mounting the one and polarized differently to the other one. So in this case the one would be horizontally polarized, the one would be vertically polarized. Inside an enclosure you can put one antenna there, typically also like to have one polarized in one direction and the other in another direction. And connect both of them. So these would be two by two MAMA. You don't always need an integrated one. You can also do your own thing, um, providing two antennas. Just if it's two by two, the best um, separation or uh, decorrelation is always provided by polarization. If it's more, then you have to go to something like four by four MAMA. Now, four by four MAMA, and we don't have an antenna that's got four antennas. Ah, sorry, we do have one, I think, at Wi-Fi bands. That's four by four integrated. But otherwise, you can use two two by twos, and you can space them. And I'll show you the spacing a little bit later. And that will give you four by four. And of course, if you want Omni, you can actually go and mount four Omni antennas next to each other. You can also mount two next to each other and two above them, etc. cetera. So um, once again, that would be four by four MIMO. Four by four MIMO, you're relying on um, uh, you're relying on the reflections to give you 4x4 four four because polarization can only give you 2, double your speed. But these guys can also make use of reflections to find two different pathways between a transmitter and receiver. So they have to be mounted some distance apart. And I'll give you an indication of how far they have to be mounted. <laughs> 